panel discussion for COVID-19's impact on immigration. My name is Jenny Kim. I'm the Assistant Director for Talent here at the Research Park. Um, and I'm really excited to um, introduce and invite you um, to hear from a panel of some immigration specialists that we've uh, invited here today. Um, the general format, um, they will introduce themselves and provide kind of an update from their different perspectives, and then we are going to open it up to Q&A. So um, feel free, as I said again, to go ahead and type your questions into the chat window and we will get those asked for you. Um, but I'd like to briefly introduce the panelists. We have today with us Stephanie Dvorak, who is the Associate Director for the Student Advising Branch of the International Student and Scholar Services Office with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign long title there, as the university is very good at. Uh, we also have Alan Singleton, uh, who is an attorney at Singleton Law Firm. And then we have Gloria Yen, who is the director for uh, the New American Welcome Center that is uh, housed within the YMCA on, cam on campus, I believe, yes. Um, okay, so let me start sharing the screen again, and we will get started here because we have a lot of good information coming your way. So we are going to begin with Stephanie and she is going to tell you a little bit more about her role and her office and then give us some updates um, from the campus point of view. So take it away, Stephanie. Okay, hi, um, I am Stephanie Dvorak. I'm the Associate Director for International Student and Scholar Services. Yes, long, long name, long title. Um, I mainly my role within the Office of International Student and Scholar Services, I oversee the student advising branch. So my job is to um, kind of interpret federal regulations and how they relate to um, school, you know, F1, J1 students who are studying um, at the University of Illinois. So um, during this time, <laughs> it has been um, pretty, pretty, pretty challenging just because um, we have a lot of new guidance that's being thrown at us. Um, I was just mentioning to the other panelists between every, every five and 10, 10 days, um, we get new guidance from SEVP, um, which is student exchange visitor policy. So um, that's been fun to keep up with. Um, so what, what I'll talk about is I'm going to go through the different types of work authorization, CPT, OPT and OPT STEM. Um, I kept my slides brief because things are changing so often. I don't want to put anything in writing um, because they could change right after this presentation's over. So um, I'll, I'll go from what we have today. Um, I'll briefly describe the kinds of work authorization and then I will um, talk about challenges and questions that have been coming up with our student population. And yes, I'm working from home with a five-year-old, so I'm really, really sorry if things get a little crazy, but hopefully that'll just keep it fun and keep it real. So anyhow, um, CPT. CPT is curricular practical training, which is off-campus work done during the course of a student's studies. Um, so CPT is something that is related to the student's studies. Um, they have to be in full time, they have to be full time students for two full semesters before they're approved. Um, there are some exceptions given for grad students. Um, grad students whose program requires immediate participation could possibly be um, eligible earlier than the two full semesters. Um, something else that, that students need to consider with CPT is just that that authorization is done through our office. So the Office of International, the Office of, sorry, everyone. Um, so the Office of International Student and Scholar Services is the one that is authorizing that. Um, so it usually takes us about a week to put an authorization on a student's immigration record, and then they're eligible to work. Um, CPT is employer date location specific. So students are only allowed to work for the company listed on their immigration document on their I-20 for the F1 students at the location given, um, which I'll get to that maybe in a little bit about the different location challenges right now. Um, and then for the date specified. So students are only specified for a certain time and those are the only dates that they're allowed to work. Um, challenges during this time for um, the CPT um, is that students are working remotely now, as we know, um, most of us are working remotely. 
that's the, the, the same for students. Um, so they are, they're working remotely. Is it okay for them to work remote? Yes, um, SCVP has given guidance that it is definitely fine for students to be working um, within their homes at this point. Um, we've also been, um, when, when this whole thing first started, we were telling students that they needed to update us with their remote locations. Since then, we've received guidance um, to say that they, they don't really need to update us. Um, you know, if, if they're working remotely, that's fine. There's no need to change any, um, the location on their I-20 that, that's listed as of now, um, because SEVP, SEVP has come up with this guidance. Um, it was really for OPT, but we, we interpreted that to mean all practical training, so they don't need to update us, which is nice, because that was, you know, that would have been a whole lot of work to be updating students, um, you know, up, updating their I-20s. The, the one thing that students have been showing a lot of concern about for CPT um, is just the two semester requirement in order to participate in CPT. Um, students have to be in an immigration status for two full semesters before they're eligible to apply. And right now, um, you know, we don't know if the University of Illinois is going to be online for the fall. Um, so this has been a huge topic of concern. Well, what if I can't come in the fall? What if classes are online? Am I going to be eligible for CPT in the summer? Um, the answer right now is no. Um, so that is um, very um, hard for students to to understand, especially since there is that exception given for some graduate students. However, the program itself has to require immediate participation um, and that has to be for all students. It can't just be like a special exception because a student's international. The program itself has to require immediate, immediate participation in an internship. So that's, that's part of the, that's that's part of the part of the problem. Um, so a, a couple of different departments have been reaching out to me thus far um, and are you know asking about this and I'm like you know there's really there's really nothing that I mean there's 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 nothing good that I can you know say um, because this is you know this has always been this has always been such um, students have to be in a status in an immigration status in the U.S. We can only activate the F1 status if they are inside the US. So unfortunately, you know, that's going to be two full semesters. And if falls online, falls not going to count. Um, and that is um, somebody, uh, Kathy put that in the chat. This is from the ICE um, coronavirus guidance that, that's been given. This was, um, I think this was one of the last updates that was done on May 12th, I believe. Um, so it, it specifically says, does, does time spent studying outside of the U.S. during COVID-19 count towards the one-year requirement for CPT and OPT? Um, basically, they accrue the time inside or outside, but the student has to be in active status. So if it's the student's first semester in the fall, they are not going to have an active immigration status in the fall semester. So that's where you know, the big, the big issue is that, that we're seeing. So students who, um, you know, are planning to come in fall, wanting to do a summer internship, that's not gonna be possible unless they're able to come in fall. So um, that's CPT. If, if um, we can go ahead and change the slide, that would be great. So OPT kind of um, similar, you know, CPT is done during the course of a student's studies. OPT is done after. Um, the course of the studies, typically there is such thing as pre-completion OPT, but that's usually students just do CPT instead, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, OPT, like CPT, has to be related to the student's major. Um, there are certain time requirements on OPT. It has to be at least 20 hours a week to count as employment. It can be paid or unpaid. Um, students are eligible for 12 months of OPT per educational level going up, so you know, 12 months at a bachelor's, 12 months at a master's, 12 months at a PhD um, going up. So there's, you know, quite, quite a lot of, of time that they're, they're able to use for that. Um, similar to CPT, they do need the two semesters of study prior to approval. So again, um, this has been a huge um, 
sticking point for the students. It's, it's been a, a, a big challenge. You know, there's a lot of students. I, I'd say this is affecting our students who have the one year master's programs. Um, so students who have a one year master's degree program planned on coming in um, fall, fall, spring, and then, you know, going to work in the US after that. If um, we are online and if they cannot come to the US to activate their immigration status, they are going to be in the same sort of boat as these CPT students. Um, so that's not, not great um, for our students either. Um, one, one thing about the OPT, um, they are able to, you know, we, our office recommends the OPT for the students and then the application is adjudicated through USCIS. Um, so the application takes longer. Um, students don't need an employer to apply for OPT. We in fact recommend that even if students have an employer, that they don't put that <laughs> on, their, on their application because we don't like the government to make um, assumptions about if, if their employer is related to their studies or not. We, we feel the, the less information, the better on that one. Um, so we recommend that our students apply unemployed and then when they find their job or if they have a job, they report the employment to us and we can update that information within the SEVIS, the, the immigration system. Um, so, there's, so, so there's that part of it. Um, so students can have some unemployment time for OPT related to their studies. Um, 90 days is what they get per, per the 12 months. Um, some of the considerations that we are seeing right now, um, some of the guidance that we've been given right now for, for OPT, um, it hasn't been, it hasn't, it hasn't been great. Um, we've, we've had a lot of questions. Students have had a lot of questions about unemployment time. Uh, students right now have 90 days of unemployment while they're on OPT. Um, many students have asked, you know, what, is, is this going to be waived? Uh, are we going to have more days because it's an emergency? Um, you know, people in, in my field have been asking DHS about this. DHS is apparently evaluating this issue um, and have not returned um, an answer for it. Um, so there's, so there's that. So that's, that's one of the big questions about OPT unemployment time, just because you know, uh, obviously employers aren't really hiring right now. So, you know, can we get this extended? Well, now, no. Um, as I mentioned before, um, usually students are required to do 20 hours per week while on OPT. Um, right now, um, SEVP is considering students working less than 20 hours per week as still employed. Um, there's also been a question of what if a student is furloughed um, or something of that nature, will they be considered unemployed? No, um, students who are furloughed, students who are doing less than 20 hours per week just due to working conditions um, are not accruing unemployment. So that's, that's good news. Um, we were very happy <laughs> to, to, to see that when that, when that happened, um, when, when SEVP was able to give that guidance. Um, there's, there's a couple of other student concerns just, um, as I mentioned, you know, does, does a student need to update um, us if they're working at a location other than what's on, you know, what, what they've told us? No, remote work is okay, again, so that's good news. Um, good news for us, not having to update all of those students who are on OPT, um, so, so that was nice. Also, um, another big question that we've been getting from our students is, um, are we able to apply for OPT outside of the US? So students who have been studying, perhaps this past spring was their last semester and they went home, you know, when all this was taking place in, in March, um, would they be eligible to apply for OPT, you know, really during this time and they, they're already home like in India or something. Um, Again, no guidance given for that, um, no, no direct, yes, it's okay to apply from outside of the US. Our stance is that we will request, um, we will go ahead and issue that I-20 request, we'll request OPT for them. Students can send in their application and see what happens. Um, we are not adjudicating these applications, we're letting USCIS done this, um, do, do this, excuse me. 
Um, this has always been our stance, so nothing has changed. Um, we will tell students it's probably not going to be allowed. Um, you'll probably get denied, but we're not going to, you know, we're, we'll, if, if you want to try, that's your, your choice. Um, so that's, that's kind of, that, that's how we've been for a long time for that one though. I've seen students be approved who were outside of the U.S. before. So um, I don't know if times are different now and that may have changed. That was probably seven years ago, but um, still, you know, we'd, we'd tell students the worst that's going to happen is there, you know, you'll, you'll be out of your money and you won't be able to be approved, but we can certainly create that request for them. Um, so that, that's another, another topic of concern that's coming up for students. You know, they're, they're very worried about their employment time. They're very worried about being able to apply, um, you know, just the job market, all, all of that. So that's, that's been, that's been kind of tough um, for our students. And again, we don't, don't have any formal guidance about a lot of the questions that we've been that we've been asked. We're still waiting um, for some of that. Stephanie, have you been seeing any delays in processing time of after they've applied and receiving it? No. Um, so that's a good question. The other thing is, I, I didn't really meant I didn't mention this, but but I will. Um, part of the guidance that we were given, not having to do with work authorization, only for F1 students, we are able to issue I-20s electronically. Um, we weren't able to do that before, so we are able to issue, I mean, we could always, I mean, we could always do that, but now it's okay for us to sign them digitally and send them. Um, so we've been doing that. We've been, you know, telling students just print them out, sign and send. Um, but I have not heard any delay in processing time. Um, in fact, in, uh, and this was all before this had all started too you know, right early March, mid-March, we were seeing about two month processing time versus three. So it was kind of faster at first, but I'm not sure where we're at now. Um, we periodically check with students, but we, I, I don't have any good like data on how, how far. I, I'd say they're probably right about three months again though, if I had to guess. Okay, I'll talk about STEM and I'll try to hurry. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to take up too much time here. Okay, so the STEM extension. STEM extension, um, students are given um, two 24 month um, extensions if they have a degree in science, technology, engineering, and math. This rule was changed in 2017. Yeah, 2017, there used to be one 17 month extension for STEM. Now there's two 24 months. Um, same thing as OPT, post-completion OPT, the, the level has to be higher. Um, the other thing, company has to be E-verified. Uh, the other thing is that a student is able to use a previous degree to apply for the STEM extension, which makes things nice and complicated all at the same time. Um, so that was part of the new, new guidance that we, were, that we were given about three years ago exactly. Um, the other thing is students have to fill out a nine, I-983 as part of the STEM um, application. They turn that into our office and that allows us to create the I-20 with the OPT STEM recommendation. The I-983 is a training plan that's filled out by both the student and the company. Um, so with that, um, that's a, a brief, so students, you know, if, if they're doing OPT and OPT STEM, like the way that they could maximize the time, um, I believe that in total they could get seven years of um, OPT and STEM if they were doing like bachelor's OPT STEM, master's OPT STEM, PhD OPT, you know, it would be total of seven years of um, U.S. work authorization. So that's that's nice. Um, guidance during this time. So the, the different, the guidance that we were given during this time, um, good news for us. Um, we, we had, we, we've had a lot of good, good news, I feel like in terms of, um, you know, are students allowed to work remotely? Yes. So this was really a concern for us um, with STEM more than anything, because STEM has this 983 training plan that's very like, you know, student has to be evaluated constantly, um, you know, they're, they're constantly being evaluated by their employer. It's really focusing on the training part portion. So how are they going to be trained? Um, if they're remotely, are they able to work in their home country? Like, you know, all, all, of, all of these sorts of questions. Um, are they even allowed to do this? Because that was, it's really, that was really a no before. <laughs> um, students weren't really allowed to work remotely if there wasn't an any, any part of the employee's like supervisor on site or anything. So, 
Um, good news is we got is that they can, they can work remotely even outside of the US, just as long as the employer's able to, um, you know, kind of train them and evaluate, evaluate them electronically. Uh, so that was really, really good news um, because that would have been a bad one. I think that was the one that we were most concerned about just because of the extra, extra step of that training plan. Um, students also do not need to update their 983 with the new employer location. So that was really great news as well. Um, I'm very happy about that. Very happy that students didn't have to do that. Very happy that we didn't have to update that um, either because that would have not been very fun. Um, so that was that was the big um, that that was the big big update with the OPT STEM. Um, OPT also, you know, with like regular OPT, um, if they work if they work less than 20 hours per week, furloughed, all of that stuff, they would still be considered employed. They would still be considered engaged in employment. So that was good. Students are not accruing any additional unemployment. Um, just as a side note too, students who are on the OPT STEM extension do have 150 days total of OPT, but they're not, they're not using that dur during this time either. So um, there, was, there was that. So that was, I think these were all, all good news, but there's still a lot of, you know, a lot of information that we're waiting for as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that update. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, next we'll have Alan Singleton tell us a little bit about um, kind of post OPT, so more of the H-1B and kind of any legal concerns that um, he's come to see. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Alan Singleton. Uh, entrepreneur in residence and uh, have an office in the U of I Research Park, which I'm not currently sitting in. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, from, the, from the perspective of what we work with, a lot of times we pick up things when uh, Stephanie has um, finished her work. Uh, we, when we talk to companies, we make sure that if they are employing students, we need to make sure that they are getting the proper, proper work authorization through IISSS. Uh, and, uh, but then we can also advise the students on some of the aspects of a little bit how to maximize um, their use of some of these tools, uh, and in particular as they think about starting companies. So um, the, uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, immigration changes that we're seeing right now, of course, in-person services have stopped, uh, but, you know, we continue to have H-1Bs being processed. Uh, it's just being done remotely. Uh, you know, the one benefit is uh, green card interviews have been, uh, uh, been waived in some instances, uh, and they're currently suspended through uh, June 3. So uh, that was one nice little development that did occur. Um, and I will add that uh, Alex Chung is uh, another attorney on my office, and uh, I'm kind of the big picture guy. But if uh, he may uh, chime in or if we have specific questions, uh, Alex may chime in as well. And he, I see him on the call. Um, uh, let's see. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. From the perspective of uh, continuing on the in-person services of STOP, you know, embassies and uh, consulates are not available for appointments until further notices, uh, until further notice. Uh, it's related to travel bans and things of that nature. So if, if in the past you might have traveled to Canada to get your TN re renewed at the border, uh, that was a very common thing to do. Uh, that's not gonna be uh, possible at this time. So next slide. Uh, <clears throat> In general, the travel bans and uh, the, the, the possibility of not getting back into the country uh, have uh, resulted in if you are not a U.S. citizen and are reliant upon uh, some immigration permission to get back into the company, uh, it's probably not a good idea to leave if you are planning to come back at this juncture because it's going to be difficult to get back in. Uh, and if you go overseas, you may face quarantines and things of that nature. Uh, even U.S. citizens are facing these issues as well. So uh, international travel is just 
not a good idea if you have any immigration issues at all at this juncture. Uh, next slide. Um, the uh, a consideration for H one B is you know if you are not if you're working remotely and uh, if uh, you're not in the same area, uh, it may be that you need to uh, update the H one B uh, application uh, with that fact. Uh, we'll continue to monitor that to see if there are any updates. Uh, and uh, it may be that uh, posting of an LCA notice at home of, uh, of the uh, labor condition application notice at home uh, in the home office may be needed in order to comply. We uh, would suggest you take a picture of that posting and, and uh, document the posting. Um, it, as well, if you have a situation where your work hours have been cut back from full time to part time, uh, it, uh, we would recommend filing uh, an amendment to the H-1B uh, with USCIS. Next slide. Uh, premium processing has been suspended, so uh, no premium processing at this point, uh, and the USCIS will reject any premium processing. So no extra fast services available for H-1Bs or any of these other issues. Next slide. Um, terminations. Uh, this, you know, with the current economy, this can be an issue. Uh, if, if we have uh, an employee uh, termination, uh, you need to, the employer needs to be sure to follow uh, the required uh, steps, uh, advise um, the immigration officials that that USCIS, that uh, that has occurred, withdraw the LCA, and then a uh, tender transportation uh, back to the home country to the worker, pay for the flight. Um, Terminated employees should be mindful of accumulating out of uh, status days to avoid uh, future immigration consequences. It would seem that there should be some relief in this area, but uh, Alex did some digging and had not, we have not found anything yet. Uh, ways to avoid you know, uh, unlawful presence would, you know, see if you can go to school, uh, find another job, uh, and, uh, you know, tr try, to, try to maintain compliance because if you do have unlawful presence, um, uh, by way of example, 180 days of unlawful presence in a, in a year can result in a three-year ban. Uh, one year of unlawful presence can uh, result in a 10-year ban. So, you know, you, you want to avoid those types of things if you can. It sure seems like there ought to be some hardship waivers on some of this, and we'll see how all that all works out. Uh, but if you do have the ability to avoid uh, creating that issue for yourself, and if you end up getting terminated, I would recommend taking those steps to go to school or try to find another job, uh, even if it's not uh, a perfect job. So, next slide. Uh, let's see. So uh, there is a 60-day uh, delay or uh, grace period with respect, res with respect to certain filings, uh, requests for evidence, and some other things. So this recognizes that attorneys and, uh, may not be in a position to act quite as quickly as they did, and, uh, as well as uh, you know, the individuals going through this process. So uh, there is the 60-calendar-day grace period. Uh, for due dates that has been uh, implemented uh, under certain circumstances. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> there have been various uh, politicians, uh, including our, our, our president, who have made uh, numerous uh, tweets, calls, uh, announcements about possible uh, suspension of uh, immigration, uh, but not, no actual changes that have had a material effect uh, that have been very public have actually occurred. The, uh, uh, the proclamation that went into effect April 23, uh, suspending entry of new green cards from outside of the U.S. for 60 days, um, really didn't have any effect because the embassies and consulates were closed anyway. Uh, now, if that gets uh, 
extended and those things open up, then that could be an issue. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess from the perspective of, um, you know, employers, uh, make sure you're doing what you need to do uh, to uh, document things uh, to the extent you uh, might be uh, a student or going through the immigration process. Um, you know, there may be some uh, things that develop over time that uh, recognize the, um, the the changes that are occurring, but do try to react to the best you can to either stay in school on you know on a student visa or uh, land a job that's uh, going to meet uh, one of the uh, criteria that uh, Stephanie uh, described, uh, OPT or something of that nature. Um, so that's kind of all I have from a formal perspective at this point. So. All right, great. Thank you, Alan. And we'll uh, go on to Gloria, and then we will open it up for questions. Hi, everyone. I am Gloria Yan, the director of the New American Welcome Center at the University YMCA. Uh, we are one of several programs at the Y, which focuses, if you haven't been there, it's on Wright Street across from Lincoln Hall, and we focus on really creating campus and com community connections and student, le student leadership development in the areas of global engagement and environmental protection, social justice, and interfaith collaboration. So the program that I'm with, the New American Welcome Center, if you go to the next slide, Jenny, um, we have a range of direct and referral services and also bridge building activities that we offer for the community at large. Um, we work with all immigrants regardless of their legal status. Some of our programs include a multilingual helpline in Spanish, uh, English, French, Chinese, and Arabic, just trying to connect uh, people to different types of resources in the community. We also offer immigration legal services, primarily focused on family-based um, immigration matters and also humanitarian relief. Uh, so this includes things like helping people apply for their green cards, for DACA, renewals, for citizenship, things like that. We don't have any immigration attorneys on staff, but myself and another one of our staff are have a special designation for community-based organizations from the Department of Justice. Um, we have a pathway to citizenship, um, which includes free citizenship, ESL for citizenship classes for people preparing for um, preparing to naturalize, and also we help them through the application process. Um, more generally, we also work on um, just trying to create a more welcoming environment for immigrants here in Champaign County. So we do that by focusing on six different areas of immigrant integration from citizenship and civic engagement to community development to economic integration and employment to health and well-being, language and education, and also public safety. So through that, we get to work with a lot of different partners in different sectors. And that's been really neat to just see how people are um, not only addressing the media, but working towards a better future um, where everyone is included. Um, one of the big pushes that we were doing prior to the pandemic and also continuing on today is just making sure that um, everyone in our community is represented in this year's decennial census. So I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but um, almost, I believe, one in every two foreign born um, in our community entered the U.S. after 2010. So for th this is a first census for many people and there's just a lot of funding and representation at stake. So with regard to immigrants, I'll just quickly talk about immigrants in Champaign County. Um, in May of 2018, we released a data report working with the New American Economy, a nationwide organization, if you go to the next slide, um, that looked, took decennial census data together with American Community Survey to present a snapshot of our immigrant community. And so if you go to the WISE website, universityymca.org slash welcome, you can read the full report. But basically some of what it talks about is the fact that we have almost 24,000 um, foreign born in our community coming from over 115 countries around the world. Um, about the breakdown in that for on-campus and off-campus communities is about 10,000 people are from um, the U of I student um, and staff population and 14,000 are 
14,000 are in the broader community at large. And so again, at the Welcome Center, we strive to serve everybody um, in our community. The next slide kind of shows a little bit of where um, people are primarily coming from. And so you'll see, I don't think anything surprising here that a lot of um, immigrants in our community come from East and Southeast Asia, pursuing things like school, but also um, job opportunities, safety, reuniting with their families, et cetera. Two of the largest areas of growth in terms of the constituencies that we serve at the New American Welcome Center we've seen over the past few years is from um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and also from Central America, where a lot of people are escaping um, pretty scary conditions right now. If you move on to the next slide, I'll share about um, our kind of four-pronged COVID-related responses. So I know that Stephanie and Alan talked a lot about um, kind of the legal piece, and I'll talk more generally about how we're addressing concerns um, for immigrants outside of the legal arena. So one of the first things that we started to do um, was centralize information. So there's, you know, everybody's getting multiple digests um, through different channels on your phone, over TV, in the newspaper, et cetera. And it's really hard to kind of distill, you know, what really matters and what's important. So we try to centralize information relevant to immigrants in CU um, through a resource guide that has now been translated into Chinese, French, and Spanish. It includes resources about everything from, you know, multilingual information about the coronavirus and how to um, combat stigma and racism against particularly Asian communities right now. Um, also information about understanding um, your stimulus payment, how to look it up if you haven't received it yet or don't know if it's coming, information about unemployment benefits, um, crisis hotline information for domestic violence, support, um, emergency child care for example, for example, food assistance, different relief um, options at the federal, state, and local levels for small businesses in our community. We have a lot of immigrant business owners. Updates that are happening from USCIS. We have a lot of people that we work with um, that have been affected by the USCIS office closures and interviews being rescheduled. So I know that in March, for example, there were naturalization ceremonies canceled in both Peoria and Urbana that affected probably easy, easily over 150 local residents um, who are now kind of in this holding state where they've passed their naturalization interview, but they can't yet become citizens. And depending on how long this drags out, this has some pretty serious implications on different facets of their life, but also on whether or not people can vote this November. Um, there are also in the guide are things about volunteer opportunities. So I encourage you to check it out. The URL is on the bottom. And one thing just to quickly highlight is um, this is mostly information about resources, but there's also on the slide, you'll see a little QR code for our Tai Chi class that happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. So we know that, you know, self-care and trying to step away is really important right now. So we invite you to join us um, every Sunday at 10. Moving on to the next slide, we also quickly launched an immigrant relief fund. To date, we've raised um, over $80,000 to provide direct emergency financial relief to immigrants in our community. We've received over 200 and I think 30 applications to date totaling over $220,000 in requests for assistance. So yes, we've raised 80,000 and that's great, but the need is really high. And a lot of that is due to different reasons, um, but most of the people that we're serving, 88% of our applicants um, are our applicants with insecure status, many of them undocumented and many of or who lived in mixed status families and don't qualify um, for federal relief at the moment. If you look at the graphic on here, you'll see that um, we've been asking, trying to figure out, you know, what sector of employment people have been coming from. And um, it, there's a pretty wide range, um, but a lot of them come from the food and um, service industries. And we also have seen nearly one in 10 applicants um, our students, whether undergrad or grad students, both at the U of I and at Parkland. And some of these students are um, on DACA, some of these students are graduate students, some are visiting scholars, some are asylum seekers. Um, and a lot of students are facing really challenging decisions right now in terms of, um, I really need to, for example, make my rent payment, but to do so, I'm dipping into my tuition costs for the upcoming semester. And some of these students are not eligible um, for the CARES Act relief that, for example, the U of I and Parkland are administering right now, again, because of their immigration status. So 
there's a link to more information if you would like to both apply um, or to donate to the fund. Moving on to the next, we've also been trying to capture, you know, we know a lot about what, how um, the pandemic has affected the working population of our, especially low income working population of our community at large, but we also wanted to get a sense and a pulse on immigrant owned businesses. And so over the past few weeks, we've surveyed um, at this point, I think 34 immigrant businesses, we're trying to hit 50 just to understand um, what's going on for them and potentially what are some barriers to accessing different forms of relief and to becoming operational again as we think about the economic recovery of our community and so um, again most I would say close to 43% uh, of the businesses we interviewed are restaurants and cafes. Um, the rest are groceries. We interviewed some that operate in the informal economy and others are, you know, kind of specialty shops from beauty salons to um, auto stores to a car dealership, for example. Um, and if you look at the primary concerns that people have been sharing with us, um, they include things like business survival, general health and safety for themselves, their families, their customers, um, and everybody wants a return to no normal. But also I think what's interesting to note is a lot of businesses raised like concerns over uncertainty over the U of I calendar because it drives so much traffic and um, a lot of businesses have been especially hard hit because April and May are super high traffic times of year, especially for businesses that operate on campus who depend on things like mom's weekend or graduation um, to make a lot of their businesses. So that's another thing that we've been doing. If any of you are business owners, immigrant business owners and you would like to talk to me, please send me an email. I would love to um, interview you. We're also trying to compile a immigrant business owner directory for people who would like to be featured. So to drive um, some traffic your way. And finally, I said that I would come back to the census. So just real quick, um, if you're a college student and you haven't taken the census yet, please do so. Um, college students who live away from home should be counted at the on or off campus residence where they live. So if you live on campus um, in U of I housing, you'll be taken care of. But if you live in an apartment, please take the census, even if you were at home outside of Champaign County on April 1st. And the reason for that is that um, there it are billions of dollars in federal funding that the government is preparing to allocate for everything from transportation to um, stuff for roads, hospitals, social services, et cetera. And every single person living our, in our community can bring as much as between $1,400 to $18 a year for the next 10 years. And so it's really critical that we are represented as one of the few communities in the state of Illinois that has actually grown in the past 10 years that we're bringing those dollars in. And it also affects our congressional representation um, we are pretty high risk of losing um, up at least two congressional seats in the US House of Representatives um, so your voice matters and it's really easy it only takes about five minutes you just go to www.my2020census.gov and um, for those of you who are foreign born um, again the census counts everybody so if you're living and attending college in the US uh, you should count so that's all I got. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, so the con contact information for all of our speakers, Kathy has um, put that into the chat window, but if there are any uh, questions that we have from the audience, feel free to go ahead and um, type those into the chat window. I think uh, we've got some positive information and uh, some concerns that have come up, but I think this was very helpful. Um, Jenny, can I go ahead and ask mine? Um, I wasn't sure yes. of what's happening with F1 visas. Are they still being processed for new students coming to the university? Uh, maybe that's a question for Stephanie just to update us of, of new enroll, newly enrolled students or continuing coming into the fall. I know you talked about changes or of if, if fall is online, how that might impact CPT or OPT, but what about just the F1 status? Sure, so, you know, what we've heard, uh, like a lot of this is just very hard to, you know, it's, it's just very hard to 
validate, you know, or, or like make absolutely certain that these things are happening. What we have heard though, um, and I, I will share, um, is that, um, that embassies are opening in China in July and August. Um, that's what I've heard late July, August. And I think that's probably for, you know, the, the major, major embassies, which would be Beijing and Shanghai. Um, I have heard that India, the first appointment is October 1st. Um, and again, I, you know, these are just what, what we're hearing. So I just want to be, I just want to be um, careful in saying that I'm not, I'm just so video on, like, I'm just not 100% sure. Um, we heard from a student earlier this week or last week um, saying that he had an appointment in Mexico City, June 15th. So I think it just really depends on the area or the region. Um, but even with that, like I'm, we, we are very, we're just very unsure about how many students are actually going, going to make it. And, and these would be just for students who are either new initial or need a new entry visa. But then, you know, that brings up the other question, which maybe I don't know if anybody has this, but I'll just address it. Just like, you know, if students leave and come back, will they be able to, you know, come back? Will they be able to get back um, due to these, like, um, you know, some, some countries are banned from entering the US if they're coming from a certain country. So, you know, that's another question. We've been telling students that if they are leaving, um, you know, definitely be concerned that, that you might not be able to return. So that's not easy to tell students because you don't know, you know, what's going on in their lives. But um, yeah, I mean, I think if, if, if anyone's leaving the US, it's definitely risky and trying to return just because who knows you know, what will be going on with the pandemic as, as well in, in three months. So yeah, a lot of uncertainty. So new students who are enrolling that are international students, mm -hmm. the process would be that they would have to be able to go to an open um, consulate in their yeah, home that's... country to be able to get their F1 visa. So if there are no consulate appointments, they could not obtain it in some other means. Yes. Um, and yeah, so that, you know, the, the, the dates that we're hearing, I, you know, who's to, who's to know until the dates come up, come about, you know, what we just, it's, it's just very uncertain. So those are, those are, that's what we've heard, but I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guarantee anything at this point. All right. It looks like we do have one question from the audience um, regarding L1 visas. Are those still being processed or have they also been suspended? And do we know if this and do you know if the suspensions are being based on the country that you're applying from, or just a general blanket uh, suspension at this point? I, Alan here. I don't know the answer to that, but I would be happy to uh, check into it and respond directly to that individual offline. If, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. I have another question that's come from somebody who's on a current H-1B, so I'll direct this one at Alan. If somebody's on an H-1B for an employer and they're looking to move employers, will that be restricted because it's in essence a new H-1B application or that it would take an eight month delay or something like that to make it possible because there's not the expedited processing? Uh, it's There wouldn't be the expedited processing, but it doesn't count against the, the, the numbers. Uh, you're, you're transferring from one employer to the other. Uh, so it would be my understanding that that uh, is still a possibility and can be, can be done. So it could be done and it doesn't necessarily require a delay of a year or something like that, that might be possible to go straight from one H-1B employer to another. Is that correct? That is my understanding. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yeah, we, we have one more. Um, are the YMCA legal services free for students? Gloria? Yes, the, the YMCA legal services, and I can send out a link to um, a description of our legal services, but we we have a fee schedule and we regularly waive 
um, fees for students who can't make, make it. As long as it's within our kind of area of service, otherwise we refer to other attorneys. We work with a network of six um, pro bono attorneys in the community who do work um, both in the immigration and non-immigration area. So if you need to reach out, we can try to figure out something that works for this situation. We have a question about EB3 categories. Does anybody have any information there? So since there aren't any, oh, I'm sorry. Can you shed light on how bad the retrogression for the EB3 categories might be after all of this? Yeah, I don't have any comment right now, but you know, I would just continue to monitor it and I'd be happy to look into it and respond to uh, the individual. Up oh, here, uh, my colleague at my office uh, is saying it'll get worse. Uh, this is Alex, who's the detail person, the attorney at my office says it'll get worse, but it was already really bad for Indian and Chinese citizens, so. Okay. Well, it looks like we may be wrapping out of questions. I think Jenny is also likely to say thank you for all of you that have joined us as experts today and volunteering your time and helping maybe many people who are struggling with immigration issues, whether those are students, recent graduates, or professionals in our community. As Gloria's described, immigrants are a huge importance to our community. They play a really important role in our workforce throughout the research park and tech community, but also in many jobs and services that we rely upon in Champaign-Urbana. And we're proud to have such a diverse and inclusive community. So we're hoping that we can continue to provide the support services that keep everyone um, here. Thanks so much. Thanks. And we will have the recording up tomorrow morning and we will also share the slides that were presented today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.